I'll for one second. Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, ILT Waterloo is a community that thrives on shared knowledge. Uh, we've been around since 2014. We're over 1,700 members now, so that's awesome that the community is just growing and thriving. So as each of our events unfold, there's only two primary goals, to learn something new and to meet somebody new. Uh, these events are made possible by community partners, Lodge Sense, IEEE Young Professionals, Descendants Tonight. So uh, this is a, a great thanks to them that we're able to keep on doing this. So today we're going to hear from two expert talks. Then we're going to have some networking, followed by community announcements. We're going to hear from Shiva of Pit Stop, George from Alert Labs. Uh, housekeeping, I believe the bathrooms are right down here. Uh, support Descendants tonight, get yourself a drink. And then after the talks, we're going to have a half hour networking. We're on time, we're going to keep this going. Uh, we're going to have George Tenzora as President and CEO of Alert Labs up next. George is a Waterloo Region native who is passionate about technology, business, product management, and designing cool stuff. He spent the majority of the last two decades in the professional audio video space working for Christie. George is now focusing his insatiable appetite for technology on creating products for Alert Labs. He co-founded Alert Labs in order to nurture a fun, imaginative, non-corporate culture where great is celebrated. Please welcome George T. to the stage. Thank you. Um, okay, can everybody hear me in the back? Yes? No? Okay. The minute you can't hear me, please shut out, okay? Because uh, I've got a lot to say. And in the next three hours, we have a lot of material to cover. So I, uh, I expect participation, I expect attendance and, and attention, all right? Um, all right, no, all kidding aside, I, uh, I also hope you guys can see me quite well. This is about as tall as I could possibly be. Um, but uh, tonight, I was hoping to share a bit of our story, uh, to talk a little bit about Alert Labs and what we do, um, what motivated us to, to, to build this organization and the products that we build. And then I, I kind of, I wanted to start talking a little bit about IoT and where it's going and, and, and where, where, where people in this room can, can help take it. Uh, because I still think IoT, even though we've had things on the internet for what, Blackberry Boys, two decades? Girls. We've had things, girls, people, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Please, please correct me anytime I say something stupid like that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, IoT seems to have this, this, this hype around it, but, but you know, there's all this kinetic energy that we just need to, the, you know, to, 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 to capitalize on. Um, so, um, first of all, who's technical in the room? Engineering, software, full stack developers, full stack developers are looking for a job? No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, the, uh, and, and on the business side, sales, marketing, Right? Oh, that's good. That's a good mix. That, that's fantastic, actually. Um, who here has nothing to do with IoT and, and technology and is just here for the beer? There we go. There we go. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, our story is uh, myself and my founders, basically, we, um, we work for Blackberry, uh, Christie, a bunch of tech companies in the region. Um, and one of the things that actually brought us together is that we own rental properties. Who here owns rental properties and rents products properties out? Ah, all right. This is uh, for us. It was uh, in, a, in a, a way of hedging our investments and investing for our future and, and having money for our children. Um, uh, what it ended up being is we learned about every problem that somebody could experience under the sun and having tenants. Um, tenants are wonderful people. Who rents here? Who rents homes? You guys are all great. It's, you know, it has nothing to do with with, with your lack of awareness or or, or, or or acute instincts around leaking homes and taking care of properties. Um, honestly, I don't think any of my tenants were ever malicious in all the things that happened to me. Um, but the reality is I experienced every problem as a property owner that, that, that you could ever experience. Um, from, you know, the call at, uh, in the middle of the night to come in and, and fix a furnace to uh, a tenant who left for uh, Cuba for a week in January and left the windows open to, to, to I think, I think the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was when I got a call at uh, 3 in the morning in Beijing when I was on business and one of my tenants said that, hey, listen, I, I meant to tell you about the small leak. I, I forgot. My bad. 
Um, but there's a plumber here, there's a massive disaster, and, uh, and he says it's gonna cost $5,000, you better get your ass over here. Um, so, and that for me was like, that's it, that's ridiculous. Like, why are there no tools for us to be able to, 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 to solve and, and understand what's happening in our homes? Um, and, and the reality is there are. There are a lot of devices out there. Uh, in the professional utility monitoring space, there are lots of devices they can deploy to monitor energy, to monitor gas, to monitor water, and everything else under the sun. Uh, the stuff is super expensive, it's not easily deployable, and mere mortals are, there's no way we're gonna put it in any of our properties. Um, so this is what we started, and elect, uh, basically we, we elected to kind of dive right into this business. And so what Alert Labs does is we create simple to install connected devices uh, that basically protect people's basements. We look at water, we look at energy, we look at heating, cooling, all the things that cost you money, and we basically work to make sure that we protect your basements. Um, uh, just, just to illustrate kind of uh, an example, and this is actually a, a bit of an old slide, but uh, right now we're at six million, but uh, just in the last three months, we've identified and helped stop about six million liters worth of water leaks for our clients. Now, now to, to, to picture that, sorry, that was really loud, to picture that, um, that's about, about two, two Olympic-sized swimming pools worth of water. Um, and and that, that's fantastic. I mean, we get to, we get to, to prevent our, our customers from paying that. In some instances, that would have leaked and, and caused all sorts of damage in their basements. There's a great ecology and, and conservation play there, and that's great for our customers. But who it's really great for is the insurance industry, where last year, um, they actually spent in Canada two and a half billion dollars. All of a sudden, I went all quiet. Two and a half billion dollars. Every time I say billion, what is that? Um, yeah, they spent two and a half billion dollars fixing 100,000 basements in Canada. And what's really cool is they actually spent 30 billion in the US. And when you look at these insurance companies collectively, they're gonna spend about $200 billion fixing people's man caves and fixing people's basements over the next little while. And, and you kind of go, holy shit, that's a big number. What, what happened? Why, sorry, I swear, apologies. Um, yeah, that's a big number. What happened? How did it get so big? And, and the reality is it's not that homes have become weakier. What happened was that people started expanding the living space, the basements. So basements are no longer, you know, concrete slabs with your cardboard boxes and your skates and your, your really smelly hockey equipment. Basements now are places to expand your living. Who's in real estate? Come on, there you go. You get this, right? That's what's happened. Um, so what's really, 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 really cool now is that the Insurance Board of Canada got involved and investigated and found that about 80% of these expenses were preventable that had somebody known there was a problem in the basements, they would have taken appropriate action and, and solved the issues, or minimized or mitigated the, the cost expense. And see, this is where we come in. This is where we come in and where we actually solve uh, problems for, for a few folks. So if I go down the list of uh, problems of this can go, there we go, come on. Okay. There, okay, so, um, Let's work down the list of all the players. So now, you have municipalities, and if you can't read this in the back, I'm sorry, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll dictate. So municipalities, everybody talks about smart grid, everybody talks about what's going on in that space. What people don't talk about is that these devices have a 25 to 35 year replacement cycle and they're really costly. And municipalities don't have the, the money to be able to deploy this sort of stuff. Um, they lack serious money. You have homeowners that want insights, want real-time data, they want to be proactive, they want to save money, um, and they really don't like you know, having that risk and disruption in their home, uh, but they lack tools and ability to deploy this sort of stuff. And then you have the insurers, who, as you saw, have a massive opportunity to save money, um, and they want, they, 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 they're great people. I know everybody hates the insurance industry. They're actually great people. They want their customers to be happy with the product, and they want to minimize their expenses. Who's shaking their head? Yeah, all right. I'm going to have a chat with you later. I'll introduce you to great people. But anyhow, um, but they lack products that are actually scalable and can be deployed properly in homes. So that's where we come in. Um, we put together a, a, an amazing team uh, from the region, folks from BlackBerry, from Christie. Uh, we have a, a former founder of ClearPath Robotics. We have people from Pebble now joining our team. We're 17 people now uh, building these products. And what we did was we built products that we call 
the Fitbits for your basement, in essence. I mean, that's not a, we're not allowed to market that word, but really that's what we built. We built very, 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 very simple to install devices. Um, we have, I'm actually holding our water meter here. It kind of looks like a watch. It's not a VR device. I've tried it on, it doesn't work. Um, and this device literally just straps onto your, your water meter um, in, a, in a very, very uh, simple way, which, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit. Um, but if I can go back to, da, 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 this is where, big fail. Big fail. So um, yes, Fitbits for your basement. So these are supposed to be easy to install devices that allow people to, to, to confidently and comfortably deploy and get real time data on what's happening in their homes. Um, these are accompanied by, by, oh man, okay, by, just like a Fitbit, you have an app that tells you what's going on, gives you real-time data, gives you insights. I mean, we kind of want to give people alarms when things go wrong so they can, can be proactive and, and, and engage. We also want to give them insights and data that's valuable so they can save money. And we have this rich dashboard, which I'll demonstrate in a, in a little bit with some screenshots, that gives you some serious information about what's happening in your home. Um, but what's really more important about our, our, our devices is that they are, um, they are all, um, cellular base for ease of use. People don't have to pay for internet connections into their properties, um, they, uh, whether those properties are, are cottages or their homes or rental properties or if they're snowbirds. Uh, there's, there's no internet connections. They're, they're direct to cellular devices. These are 3G and 2G devices. Um, part of the reason for that for us was that it needed to be simple. Pairing devices sucks. Cost of internet connection sucks. The un and reliability of the connection sucks. And, and any time you have to do anything that, that's less than, than seamless, um, you then have an issue with, well, is the house protected and is it not? And because most of our customers are, are insurance companies, we want to guarantee 99.9% .9 uptime and connectivity and, and real-time protection. And so our devices, whenever there's an ice storm that rolls in that we, we actually almost had the other day, who experienced power, power failures in the last couple of days? Anybody? Yeah, some people, yeah. There you go. <laughs> so in the in the uh, in the event of power failures, our devices still protect people's homes uh, on battery backup. They last for anywhere between two to three days, and so that's sort of what we wanted: simplicity, ease of use. And what's really neat about that is the insurers love that. In fact, anybody who installs any one of our devices in their home can get up to 10 to 15 percent off of their insurance in their home. So the average Canadian can save about 100 to 150 bucks back every year that this device is installed. That makes uh, ROI and payback pretty quick on the solution. So, so that's sort of how we came at it. We didn't come at this from a, hey, we built the gadget, let's see where we can go sell it. We actually came at it from, let's go solve a problem, a problem that's near and dear to our heart, and then let's find partners that, that resonate with that, and let's, let's go and, and build this. So um, we ended up doing that, and, and, and really I wanna, I wanna shift the conversation a little bit to, to what I feel, at least what my team feels, was key success factors in being able to do something like this. And, and, and far, far and beyond, the number one uh, thing that we think is probably the most important is user experience. Um, UX, um, you know, if, if your, your industrial designers, if your graphic designers aren't hammering UX at you guys, um, then, they, then they're failing. Um, UX is the way to go at solving most problems. You've got to look at what the problem is being solved, the need solving, and you've got to dive into it and make sure that you do it in, in, in an appropriate and, and, and correct way. For us, that meant that, you know, in essence what we do is we hack water meters. I mean, we, we hack water meters and take readings off directly of the water meter. But it, it's irrelevant how we do what we do. The user experience is what matters. You know, you're talking about now basement appliances and basement, you know, utility devices and furnaces and water softeners and sump pumps. And this stuff is very intimidating to a lot of people. Um, there's, there's lots of people that still don't know that the furnace has a filter in it, right? I mean, this, this stuff happens and it's normal. And it's okay. What you want to do is make sure that you understand that and you work around it and you create something that works in a seamless way. Um, things like, you know, our flood protection happens with these flood pucks that we put down. And you can put a flood puck down next to a water gear or a washing machine, anywhere where there might be a, a water, water failure. Um, you know, um, here's a, a water heater, for example. But 
when we started doing testing, user experience testing, we found that lots of people wanted to put them in their bathrooms. And every time they, they washed their bathroom floors, they would pick up these blood fucks and put them on the counter as they mop up the floor. And then they would let the floor dry before they put these blood fucks back down. Well, guess what? They don't put them back down. They forget about them. And, and there goes all your protection, right? So things like that matter. So we created our stuff in such a way that it can still stick on, be connected. You can still mop the floors and leave them down there and still have that protection. So it's user experience. Um, who here has a sump pit in their home? Okay, that, that's, uh, that's about right. About 40% of people have sump pits. Um, who here has a backup sump pump in their sump pits? That's about right. Like one in, in a room full of people. Okay. And does that backup sump pump have a battery backup to it? Ah, good man. All right, good enough. So we actually found about 60% about, about, uh, about, uh, of people that have sump pits don't have backups for some ungodly crazy reason. Um, and of the people that have backups, only about 25% of them have batteries on them to actually operate them when the power runs out. So what we wanted to do is we didn't want to know when there was a failure. We wanted to, to, to know as it was failing before it floods the house. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But our devices, again, simply clip on and you walk away. Every one of our devices you can install under two minutes with no tools, no technical expertise. We've tested it with my my mom, we tested it with my, the, 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 the grandpa across the street that, that lives from me. Um, we tested it with my dad, you know, he's not, he's not a very technically literate guy, I mean, he'll be the first to stand up and tell you that. So, um, so that, that's kind of, you know, um, what we do. Now, let me show you some interesting things and, and why I think it's important to have real-time devices. Um, you know, in your utilities, when you look at water, when you look at gas, when you look at heating, cooling, electricity, Minute by minute data is infinitely better than hourly data. And monthly data tells you nothing. You, you don't understand what's happening on a monthly basis. So I'm going to use an example of one of our customers to illustrate that. Um, you guys probably are not going to be able to see that in the back. I'm sorry. So the, the, the top chart shows a house at 1 a.m. with no water use, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Every minute there's no water use. And the people wake up, they use the water, they go to work, they come back home, they cook their dinner, they go to bed, right? That's great. The bottom chart shows a customer who asked for his money back because our devices kept giving them alarms that there were leaks in this house. And clearly there were no leaks in this house. And so we said, okay, well, what's the device say? And they're like, oh, well, the device is telling me that there's a, there's a low flow leak and there's a high flow leak, okay? So did you go investigate? No. <laughs> Can you please go investigate? So he did. And he found out that um, one of his tenants had a toilet flapper that would stick on occasionally. And he'd come back home from work. And the toilet would just be running the whole time. And, uh, and he asked him, you know, why didn't you fix that? And why didn't you tell me about it? I would have come in and fixed it. And he said, that's OK. I can fix it. I fix it all the time. Uh, as soon as I come home and it's running, I jiggle the handle and it stops. You know, And that was his fix. He just didn't know. Again, tenants are not malicious. They just don't know. Um, and, and the other one was actually a very, very, very small fill valve problem that actually amounted to about $200 worth of water a year that we caught as well. Um, we're catching problems in homes. We're catching people's uh, problems in commercial sites. This is a restaurant that had continual water use of the, about 10 liters uh, a minute. It was running all the time. They had no idea why they had high uh, uh, water bills. Um, so we worked with the city, the city deployed some sensors, and, and at the bottom it shows basically what the restaurant should have been. Um, you guys listening over here? I got some sensors for you, by the way, in case you need some. Um, so, yeah, what it should have been is that the, the cleaning crew comes in in the morning, gets ready, the, the wait staff starts prepping for lunch rush, there's lunch rush, they start prepping for dinner rush, then they wash and clean up afterwards and close the restaurant. That's what it should have looked like. Anyhow, we reduced their water by, by 80% and, and, and by, by, by identifying the problem. Um, so we do some really cool stuff. Um, we're actually in, in commercial venues. Um, and I'm, again, I'm showing you raw data now because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this to, to come back to some things that we're doing. But uh, this is the uh, Seagram Center in Guelph. This is uh, the Guelph Storm's uh, hockey rink. This is uh, people gathering for the game. This is uh, first intermission. Um, you can tell what the water use is probably for. Um, second intermission, if you need to read between the lines, they go into the bathroom and they're peeing a lot. Uh, and then third intermission, end of game, I won't show you where the guys are, are showering, but I will show you where the, uh, the Zamboni is actually filling. 
And what's really neat about this is we're actually using this data to, to, to generate business cases around great water systems and all sorts of other stuff, but things that you wouldn't be able to do without minute-by-minute -minute data. Again, just some really neat things that, that, that IoT is helping with. And so, but for us, we want to talk about enabling smart grids, enabling real-time, minute-by-minute uh, utility reading, and the fast, scalable adoption of that. And, and the challenges that I outlined early on, you know, when you talk about homeowners, and you talk about their needs and their challenges of not being able to deploy devices cheaply and, and reliably and securely and simply, when you talk about the municipalities and, and their, their capital issues, when you talk about the insurers and what they care about there, we, we feel like we're right in the middle of this. We feel we're right in the middle of it, and we feel like what we're doing is we're adding value to all three channels. Okay? The insurers get to save lots of money, the homeowners get to save lots of money, and, and the municipalities get to have a proactive you know, base of clients and customers, residents, that can then properly stop leaks when they happen instantaneously, not a month later. There's no PR nightmares that happen when, when some elderly couple gets a thousand dollar bill that they shouldn't have. I mean, and these, these things are, are what we saw. And what's really neat is the majority of this is being subsidized by the insurers because they see an ROI and a real business value behind it. So um, that's sort of um, where, where and how we come at it, but I wanna tell you where we're going and why I think um, the next steps are, are pretty exciting for us. Uh, enter, okay. So uh, I wanna talk about the sump pit for a second. And for those of you that don't know what a sump pit is, um, Basically, there's weeping tile around the house and there's a big pipe that drops water that collects in, uh, around your, your house foundation and it dumps it in a big collection bin and inside the collection bin there's usually a pump that ejects the water out and there's usually a float and the float comes up and it trips and it ejects the water and the float goes down and it fills again, etc. and it goes on and on and on and on and on. So, when we talk about IoT and the transition to what we call AOT, the analytics of things, um, let's start by talking about, over on this spectrum, what, what happens today with the Internet of Things. Today, you get information. You get raw information spit at you. You get, you get, you get um, something that says, hey, your sump pit is at six inches of water. And you get this. And you get reliable data, you get good good measurements, you get temperature measurements, all sorts of stuff. But, but let's say, this is what you get. Now, what you really want to do is then you want to add context to this. Now as you work towards the spectrum, now the context is, okay, so you now have a sump pit. Your sump pump didn't actually turn on and the water level is now rising and based on this fill rate, you're now gonna have a flood in about 45 minutes. Okay, so that, now that's kind of cool. So now, now it's telling you some things. Um, what you want to then do is now start to add a bunch of data, just like Pitstop was doing, by adding lifetime data, and mechanical data, and, and, and MTBF tables, and understanding what's happening with the device itself. And now, you want to be able to say, look, during the last cycle, this thing didn't operate properly, and was struggling to keep up. You know, there's some things going wrong here. So now you want to be proactive, so you can fix this before it actually causes problems and damage. And then ultimately, you know, because that, that's sort of the, the now it's relevant. Now it's contextually relevant to, to me and what's important to me and how I can action it. But ultimately, what you really want to get into is a space where now you mash up external weather data, you mash up all sorts of other things, and you want to get to the point where, where now this is super meaningful. Now you get to, yeah, if you can't read that in the back, that's okay, I can't even read it from up here. Um, now you want to get to a point where it says, look, there's a storm expected in two days. That storm is gonna be about a 50 millimeter dump, and last time there was a 40 millimeter rain, this thing struggled, and we think you're gonna have a major problem. Hurry up and fix this now, right? Real actionable stuff, things that are meaningful, that you can then uh, you know, deploy something out there and then makes your life easier. Because that's ultimately what IoT should do. IoT shouldn't burden your life. IoT shouldn't force you to become a data analyst. IoT should not require you to go download CSV files and load them into Excel. Like, for God's sakes, what the hell did we do with our energy data? Like, what kind of like plan was that? Sorry, that was my inside voice, right? Um, so, um, yeah, it should be relevant. It should mean it should it should matter and have meaning. So, so this is sort of 
what we're doing, and, and this is, I mean, on this scale right now, we're about in the middle. Right? Alert Labs right now is confidently in the middle. We're doing this and we're now adding more value and more meaning and we're working with our clients and our, and our customers and beta testers to, to get to that, that Zen state. Um, but so with water, for example, earlier I showed you some raw data because I think it's kind of cool to see leaks. But really where we're at is um, now on your app, you know, it doesn't just spit out data. It tells you, hey, you know what? Here's what's going on. Here's how much water you're using. Last time, for this type of period of water, you use this much. You're a little bit high, you know? Like, keep an eye on it. You know, it's telling you your house is all dry. Like, don't, don't tell me my flood pucks have no voltage across the probes. Tell me my house is dry and I'm protected and everything is fine, right? So, so this is the kind of stuff that matters. On the analytics side, I mean, now, now you get into some, some, some what, what looks really pretty on my laptop but doesn't appear. Um, now you get into what does your flow rates look like? What are your, your, your daily consumption rates look like? What is, what is your house's um, occupancy look like? And is that changing? You know, is there something weird happening with your house? And really, you want to get to a point where now, now you can start to, to, I mean, you throw game theory in here and all sorts of, uh, uh, of things around. What does my house look like compared to my neighbors? What does my house look like compared to my region? What does my house look like compared to, to Ontario? Um, so um, things like, you know, what does the actual profile of water use look like in your house? Every client that we have, their profile is totally different. Totally different. And so when you talk about the analytics engine that then works the data and gives you alarms and alerts and all that sort of stuff, it has to be very custom to it. Every house that we go to has its own usage patterns and those patterns change over time, right? And so this is sort of the, the, the things that, that we're, we're working towards. And so. Um, we, right now, are, are working across three channels to sell our, our products. We're working with insurers to sell our products to, direct to their channels. Um, we're working with wholesalers to sell our products in the water space and in the water conservation space. And we are actually engaged with municipalities now where um, in a couple of weeks you'll hear of a big press announcement where the city of Guelph is now going to launch a program joint with us to basically have all the residents engage with water conservation and water monitoring activities in their homes and, and to allow them to participate in, in, in being a little more proactive. So um, it's been kind of neat, it's been kind of exciting. We've been doing this for about two and a half years uh, and trying to get to this. We've had um, a lot of iteration and a lot of learning on what works and what doesn't work. And and yeah, for anybody that's in a, a young company, an old company, anybody who's doing any any work in this space, I can't, I can't emphasize enough that, that user experience matters. Uh, making sure that you have the right value props and you're solving problems in a, in a way your customers want them solved. And, and really, don't, don't be those guys that just spit out data. Um, you know, give some meaning and, and, and context and, and help get the entire industry to AOT. Um, so that, that's me preaching. I, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, now, now's the time. Yep, we've got 10 minutes for Q&A. Anybody got a question? Cool. Uh, please, sorry, yeah, I think you're first. Sure. You guys have any pushback on like, any, like, any vendors in the field, like any like, hardware vendors that like, you interface with? Like, is your space being kind of like a, a bigger point in space when things go wrong? I'm just curious, like, have you like, what it has with water heater companies and things like that in terms of like, well, how reliable is your data to take this? Yeah, yeah, so the, the question, if, if I can repeat it so everybody can hear it, was, you know, have we butted heads with any of the water heater companies or any of the other device and appliance companies when it comes to insurance and claims and stuff like that? Um, uh, the answer is no, actually. Uh, in fact, uh, quite to the contrary. Most, most insurers work with restoration companies to go in and fix basements and deal with that. They have flat rates on how to deal with that stuff. They don't really go finger pointing and brainstorming. Not like they used to. They used to send in people to do investigations. They used to send in people to, to, to forensically find out if, if, if the homeowner was at fault and if we can get out of paying for this thing. That's not our experience at all. Um, and and that, that, that's, that's great. I mean, look, insurance companies lose money uh, on, on leaks and floods. They lose money on fire. They lose money in all sorts of disasters. But, but that's, that's what they do. I mean, the, the, the $30 billion that they spent to fix people's basements, I mean, the residential insurance space underwrites about $270 billion worth of policies a year in the U.S. So it's not that big of a problem. They like to minimize it, 
but they just go in and deal with it. And the restoration business is booming. Um, hey, does anybody remember these sounds? Oh, Blackberry guys would remember those sounds. Um, okay, uh, other question. Have you had any application for rural, uh, rural housing? The question is, do we have rural housing applications? Um, so if there isn't a water meter, um, and if you're on a, on a, on a well, um, no, not yet. Um, we have we have other things that we can we can do there, but but they still have some pits there. We still do flood protection and all that sort of work. I'm thinking in terms of uh, cycle frequency and pressures, pressure yeah. differentials, so you can tell yeah. a if your filters you've got it on a gold starting to flood, yeah. or if you have a leak, uh, well, your pumps just going to run about a run. No, exactly. So so there there are things that we can do in that space to warn of problems, but it just hasn't been our, our main focus. Um, the the harsh reality when I have my product management hat on is that the mass market is like this, that market is like that. Um, you know, we, we, we're going after the, the big scalable opportunities first. Um, but we do have some, again, did I say billion again? What happened? Um, we do have some very clever things that we're bringing to the rural market in, in, a, in a couple of uh, uh, development cycles. So stay tuned. Yes? Where do we buy these products? Ah, good question. Where do you buy these products? Well. I, I forgot to mention that the team isn't just a, a local local person uh, company, but all our products are made in Canada, all our tools are in Canada, everything, this is all made here locally, and we sell it online. You just go to our website and buy it, and we did that because we wanted to to minimize the the adders and the margins that get tacked on through different, different retail channels and stuff like that, so we can make it as cheap as possible for people to buy them. So, Go to online, alertlabs.com, and uh, yeah, just order it. So it'll never be a Home Depot? I'm not going to... Um, now, what's interesting is the insurance discounts amount to about 10 to $15 back every month. So it nets out in a, in a positive way um, for, for the homeowner. Uh, eventually, what we're working towards may basically making the homeowner not pay for anything and get the insurance company to just subsidize it, but we'll get there. They're nice people, they're not that nice yet. <laughs> uh, there was a question in the back there. Yes, sorry. Okay. Uh, do uh, users have access to the raw data? I know they want to hide that away, but is that available to them? No, no. So the question was the users have access to the raw data. Um, for, for your, It's your house, it's your data, it's your property. You can download the raw data in CSV format, whatever format you want. Um, the data is the data. The analytics that come along with it that that's that's sort of where the value is on the on the on the, on the visual on the graphic on the dashboard. But yeah, absolutely, it's your data. Download it. Yes, I have two questions. One is uh, where do you connect this device, and how do you track the water loss? Like, so the question was where do we connect the device? Yeah, you and said then, you, you said it does it's as a Fitbit kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. we basically strap like a watch okay. around the water meter. Okay. So that's where a water meter goes. Okay. Our uh, sump pit sensor just clips onto the pipe and just looks inside the pit. It's okay. a ranging sonar, just like you have in the back of your car bumper. Okay. Um, and the uh, our uh, water softener sensor just clips onto the water softener pit. I mean, we've got a bunch of sensors that, that we sell online. Okay. Um, the um, and then the next question is, where does the data go? So so you have that device. You have, yep. you have you have to buy other sensors with it. No. Nope. So. This device gives you your leak detection, it gives you your water, it also tells you when you have power failures in your house, it tells you what your your uh, basement temperature is, what the humidity is, it tells you if you have all sorts of different issues with your property. Um, it comes with um, one flood puck okay. that, that protects wherever you want to put it. Okay. We recommend you buy a few of these and protect your house. Um, we've actually found some very interesting <laughs> things around. Now um, you get basically leaks that happen from dishwashers. Now people have moved to having refrigerators with inline water lines. Now who's got a nice maker and a water line in their fridge? Yeah, insurance companies hate you because it turns out those things fail so often and they end up destroying people's homes. Um, and so yeah, you stick one under the fridge um, and then and then this is new trend in new home built. I don't know, I haven't experienced that yet. But uh, they're putting laundry rooms up on the third story now right next to the bedroom. Everybody just wants convenience, I guess. Um, and and when a, uh, the average washing machine, when it breaks and it fails, uh, I think it spews 250 liters of water. Um, if a pipe bursts, I mean, it's, it's a disaster, right? Like, what, what 
genius ideal is that? But I don't, I don't get it. Um, but yeah, so that's what we can help protect too. Uh, yes. Well, uh, if I get correctly, so every uh, single sensor has a mobile interface and works on battery. Yeah. So about the cost, how, long, how often does the battery has to be changed? And what about the cost of uh, cell service, individual cell connection for every single... Uh, so, single so a few questions there, and I'll answer this real quick. Um, so um, the devices are plugged in all the time. They're minute by minute devices, the LED devices are plugged in all the time. Oh, they only okay. work on battery if there's a power outage. Oh, because and so, yeah, yeah the flat pucks, they operate with double A batteries and they have a two to five year lifetime on that. So, so it's just double A's that go in there. So if, um, if you're plugged into the electric, uh, yep. electrical network and building, will it be cheaper to use uh, electrical you know, wires as the communication, you know, internet connection? So the question was, wouldn't it be cheaper to use electrical wires as the internet connection yeah. and communication protocol? Um, so I put one, one uh, uh, on the, on the you know, Sure, so um, there are many ways to skin a cat, and, and some of you that have never heard that saying before might say, why are you skinning cats? Uh, um, and so, so that is one of the ways that some technologies work out there. We don't believe that, that that's appropriate for our business. Um, and ultimately, you still need an internet connection, you need a hub, and whether you do power line, ethernet over power, or whether you do Wi-Fi locally, or whether you do any of that stuff, it just didn't fit the, the professional business model that we were in. And you have no connection problem from basements, you're using cell phone connection. Great question. How, could you have any connection problems in your basement connecting with cell use, cellular, cell right? Because cell phone doesn't get there. Yeah, so, so in our experience, um, because luckily we're not streaming video, we don't have, you know, we're not doing 4G and, and LTE speeds and any of that stuff. I mean, we're, we're in the GSM band, we're, we're in, you're talking about 3G and 2G. We've rarely had network connection issues. I mean, you know, um, and when we do, we actually, we have extender antennas that, that can help that in the small cases. So, um, and the third question was cost with the telcos. We don't make our customers set up any any relationship with the telcos. They just pay us $4.99 and we take care of the rest. No long-term agreements or anything like that. For a pair sensor. Yeah, for, for a sensor, yeah. Um, Sorry, yes. You had a flood outdoors last month. Well, the water came from the outside. Um, we had the torrential downpour, ice froze, and I'm going through that process of having service master come in and have to do it. Okay. Um, the question was, do we have a ruggedized flood puck that we can use outdoors to prevent the water from coming inside? Um, not yet. Um, our devices are IP67 sealed and rated. I mean, they're completely waterproof. You can dunk them in water and all that sort of stuff. And, and yes, they could probably be used outside. We don't recommend that. Um, there are different products that can help you do that in the market of weather sealing and sealing homes and stuff like that. But to prevent water from coming into the house, our, our pucks don't do that. They just alert when there's presence of water. Right. But yeah. In this situation, yeah. I want to get the details. If in fact we had a had an alert, yeah. If no, the water was rising, if it was raining, that would have been the problem. From the drain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just just the way our house is. Okay. But you know, as an idea, yeah. Well, so, so if you do have a drain outside, our sump pit sensor then would go in there and it wouldn't be a flood puck and we'd tell you what the water level is and we'd tell you if it rises above a, a threshold and we'd send an alarm. That, that is how you do that. Um, yeah. We've got time for one more. One more. Or two more if there's two hands. Two more. All right. Uh, Brooks. In case you say in another country you lost service, uh, is there a way to set the product to assume another accessory product that's going to be connected? Like say the shut off valve for the water to actually automatically there's a lead to turn off the water. Yeah. Sure it's not going to get a signal from first. So the question is if you're traveling and you're in another country and there's an issue, is there a shut off system to shut off the water so you can just deal with it later, right? Uh, that's a great question. There are many shut off valve systems out there in, in the in the uh, in this space that I talked about in the commercial space. Um, one of the things that shutoff systems do is they break our user experience model. The idea that with no tools, no experience, in under two minutes you can install something and walk away. Um, 
Once you start having to plumb things in, once you start having to cut pipes, now you're into calling plumbers and integrators, now you're into paying fees for that. And, and it's not that that's not possible, it is possible, and, and we're working with a bunch of wholesalers to do a professional version of that product that does that. What happens though is, the adoption rate is slow. The adoption rate is, is next to nil on something like that. People just don't do it. Um, for the same reason, they don't have battery backups on their sump pumps, and they don't have backup sump pumps, because it's just hard to do, you gotta call in a plumber to do it, I'm not doing it. This one thing will do the job, and hopefully I'll be home when it fails, right? So, um, there's a question back there, I think, yes? Yeah, so the question is, when it comes to leaks, not necessarily floods, how do you establish baselines of what's normal for the house? And, and yes, yeah, so every house has its own unique signature, it's got its own occupancy level, it's got its own habits, some people have low flow shower heads, others don't, um, etc. So our system is a learning system. It, it eventually learns what's normal for the house, and learns what's normal for the house on an hour by hour basis, on a day by day basis. And we can then set thresholds on alarming off of that. Um, so that's how we catch things, even like people forgetting garden hoses on outside. Uh, my kids are notorious for doing that to me. So, so thank God now I can, I, can, I can deal with that properly. So, so the question was, would I use Laura because it's cheaper? Yeah. Are those your boys? <laughs> that, that's good, right? Did you fail? Um, we're big fans of the Laura network. We're big fans of what Laura can, can, can bring to the world. Um, our devices actually connect through Laura for our flood bucks. So our flood bucks actually are Laura based and on that frequency. Um, but you're talking about Laura WAN. And so we're basically now keeping an eye on what's happening in that space. Absolutely, it's really exciting. And we have an amazing company in town that's, uh, that, that's kicking ass and taking names, deploying products like that. Right, 11X? Yeah, there we go. So, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Anyhow, that's me. Okay. Just a couple of community announcements before we wrap up the night. So, Eddie, I don't know if you want to get up here while, uh, while I say my thing, and then you can share what you got going on. Uh, the, uh, hold on, the projector's a little skewed, but it doesn't matter. Uh, we're running a conference in October. So I have a call going out for volunteers. If anybody's interested in getting involved with that, um, come see me after. Uh, we did it in uh, 2015, uh, took a break in 2016, and now uh, we're bringing that back um, in partnership with a lot of people in the community. Um, so yeah, please come see me if you're interested in getting involved in volunteer work for the conference that we'll be putting on later in the year. Uh, before I do that, I'll let Eddie share that he's working on something that he needs some help with. Okay, um, I'm Eddie Bo. Um, do a show of hands. Uh, how many people here are between 15 years and uh, 18 years? <laughs> um, actually, how many of you uh, have uh, ch children within their uh, age, age range? Okay, thank you. A couple. So my, I'm here for my son. My son, uh, he's a grade 11 um, student. So he and his team uh, is running, a, uh, organizing a first Waterloo High School uh, hackathon. So it's happening in April uh, 9th on the, on the screen here. Uh, Jam Hacks, uh, you can see the Jam there. <laughs> so they are, uh, it's in uh, S. Sir John McDonald High School's S Gen, so it's drop an S, it's Gen Hex. Um, I'm just here to spread the word, and uh, my son went to a couple uh, hacker sound by himself, and he enjoyed it. He wanted to share with the community, so that that's, then they, their team is doing this. Um, thank you for the support. Thank you, thank you Ian, for letting me uh, announce this. Thank you. So what Eddie's looking for is anybody who's uh, interested in sponsoring. 
that initiative. Please go see him after. He's looking for help to uh, to get that going. Jamhacks.ca. Or go see Eddie. He can uh, help you out. So, I hope you all uh, had a good time tonight. Um, meeting some new people, learning new stuff. Uh, uh, as always, it doesn't happen without our partners, Logic Sense, IEEE, Young Professionals, and Descendants. Thank you so much tonight for hosting us. <laughs> Can I get a show of hands? How many people learned something new tonight? Okay, we're still we're still doing our job. How many people met somebody new? Okay, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.